feel that pseudoscience and misinformation has allow has been allowed to permeate our culture to the degree that it has because we don't stomp it out because we don't aggressively call out liars and charlatans and Hello and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today I'm here with Dave Farina of the YouTube channel Professor Dave Explains. Dave has been making educational videos across a range of topics and disciplines for many years with a focus on the physical and life sciences. Uh, Dave's channel has also featured debates, panel discussions, and video responses to flat earthers, climate change deniers, creationists, and many others in an attempt to combat scientific misinformation. Dave has also even published a book on this topic titled, Is This Wi-Fi Organic? A Guide a guide to spotting misleading science online, which is currently discounted until January 31st through the publisher and which will be linked in the description for those viewing this episode on YouTube. So again, Dave, uh, I've watched your video for many, many years leading up to this conversation. So it's quite cool to be sitting here with you today and thanks for coming on. Yeah, happy to be here. So I know you have a playlist in your channel called Ask Professor Dave, where you cover some of the most frequently asked questions of, of the people that your own audience asked about your personal life. But for those who may not have seen those videos or may mm -hmm. not be familiar with your content in general, if you could just briefly walk us through who you are and how you got here today, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess the shortest version would be I studied chemistry uh, in school and I, um, through my 20s, I was teaching a lot of chemistry. Uh, and then I had the idea to uh, start a YouTube channel uh, mainly based around, I was, I was teaching OCHEM at a, at a, at a university. And uh, I just I recorded my lectures. I basically just performed my lectures to camera and uh, made a little channel and put them online and uh, just to kind of see what would happen, see if I could get some passive income. And uh, they were received really well. So then I started making more content in uh, a variety of other topics. And uh, fast forward seven years, um, full time science communicator and YouTuber. And uh, this is what I do. And it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. And from my understanding, your main goal from the beginning was pursuing music. And this is something that you started just as a way to get some <laughs> passive income on the side. So in the past with interviews I've seen, you've been a little bit more, it seems like this, this has just been a means to an end and still ultimately music is the main goal. Do you feel the same way today or are you becoming more passionate about this whole project? Yeah, I mean, art still is the main goal, but I am really thrilled to have this science communication career and will never, certainly will never abandon it. Um, I take it very seriously and I feel a sense of duty to, to continue with it. So I will definitely be a science communicator for a very long time for the foreseeable future. Um, <clears throat> definitely, however, the goal has always been art. And, and I think this year, uh, you know, go 2023, I'm going to try to uh, pivot to some extent uh, to at least split my time with uh, music and writing and other um, other passions of mine. And I, all of that will be linked in the description <clears throat> as well on YouTube and anywhere else I can link it. So definitely go check that out. So I wanted to ask, you mentioned you, I think you, you were involved in three different master's programs of, of, of before you completed the third one in, in science education. And the first one was in synthetic organic chemistry. And I've talked to a lot of guests recently mm -hmm. specifically about the graduate school system and all of its problems essentially. So I wanted to ask, was it, what was it that pushed you away from completing that first master's program? Was it something bureaucratic, just a, a distaste for the academic system or chemistry no. related? Yeah, the, the first time I just, I never wanted to, I, I wasn't interested in doing it at all in the first place. I, I went to grad school straight out of undergrad. Um, it was just something to do. I wanted to move to California, but I, I felt like I needed a purpose or a reason, so I applied to graduate schools in California. I got accepted to UC Santa Cruz. I just wanted to play music. I thought, hey, I'll be on, on, a, on a campus. I'll meet, I'll meet musicians. Uh, I can TA, so that's a job. So I, I, I had zero interest in, um, in pursuing science seriously as a career. It was just sort of like... You know, when you're young, like you go to elementary school, middle school, high school, college, grad school, it's just the next rung on the ladder. And I was a little bit too um, anxious or apprehensive to just move to California. So I just said, all right, I'll go to that school. And I, I joined a band immediately, like within two weeks, but they weren't mm -hmm. students. They were townies. And um, they uh, around uh, March or April. Uh, of my first year, school year, they said, Hey, we're going to move. We're all moving up to San Francisco. 
Uh, so that's what's happening. And I was like, okay, I'll quit. I'll quit the school because that way, you know, what am I, what am I doing anyway? I want to play music. And it was kind of like the biggest local band, <laughs> the biggest Santa Cruz band, which at the time I thought was really cool. We were playing at the, the catalyst, uh, the, the, the venue in town and we were opening up for like Los Lobos and like Dean Ween's Moist Boys. And like, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I thought it was so great. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I had nothing holding me there. So I just quit. Yeah. And and where is your musical interest today? Are you still looking to be in a band, to front a band, to do solo work? What do you? What is the ideal goal there? Yeah. So now I have my own project. Um, I'm sort of too old to you know. All through my 20s, I was in a bunch of different bands, and then I was in one band called The Lonely Wild, uh, which got fairly successful. We were signed and touring and everything. And um, uh, once that one didn't work, I was in my early 30s, and and I just thought, all right, I'm too old to like start at the bottom anymore. So I knew I wanted to, I needed to get some income going because the main problem we faced <clears throat> was that you need so much money for music videos and recording and publicity and all these things. And I just thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this the cheap way anymore. I'm going to make my own money to do all this stuff on my own. So now that things are a little bit different financially, you know, I've been sort of cultivating my own project. I put out an EP three years ago, uh, before the pandemic, the pandemic kind of put a, put a wrench in things. But um, it's – yeah, it's my own project. I, I write everything in higher players and uh, it's very – I guess synth rock is the easiest way to describe it. A little bit progressive, a little bit psychedelic, um, a little bit you know, pretty groovy stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I, I write the songs and uh, track everything myself except guitars. I don't know how to play guitars, so I don't play that. But uh, yeah, definitely looking uh, to ho focus heavily on the live aspect. So uh, hopefully by the middle of this year, I'll be you know playing out, have have the players and be playing out. So, and how on earth do you have enough time to do as many videos as you do and all of the musical things combined? Especially if you're shifting focus to music, it, it seems like you get more done in a day yeah. than is possible. <clears throat> I sleep very little. Uh, yeah, I probably <laughs> sleep maybe five hours a day. <laughs> Uh, mm, and work relentlessly. I'm a workaholic. So, um, yeah, the, the, the idea was to backlog about a year's worth of content on the channel so that I could pivot completely to art and be continuing to release content for a year without doing any work. Um, I was getting along pretty well with that. I was about four or five months ahead, but then, uh, I actually, we bought our first house. Uh, we're expecting our second child. So we kind of upgraded, got a house. And then in order to do that, I took this really big contract with a company called Chegg. So it's a lot of content for them privately, um, for an amount of money that was going to really help, you know, with the renovations and buying new furniture and all this stuff. So I had to say yes to that contract. So I've been working on that for like two months and not doing really anything on the channel. So that has kind of eaten into my, my backlog. But as soon as I finish this contract, which I'm almost done, uh, I'm going to get back to backlogging. And so hopefully again, I can get, you know, six to nine months ahead on the channel so I can pivot and focus on art. I'm actually converting the garage to a re uh, rehearsal recording studio. Uh, so I can, you know, tinker in there all day and, uh, you know, maintain the channel, but definitely sort of do both. It's, I wanted to ask you about some of that because, you know, there's such a spectrum of, of how, how much money people are making, the, the different revenue streams people have. And what I guess is nice in the case of your content is it's sort of evergreen. I mean, I think they're just, they will never stop accumulating yes. views. There's no time at which people don't have to stop learning ionization energies yeah. and so on and so forth. So do you, I guess yes. that's only going to get easier for you in the future? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Educational content is the ultimate evergreen content. Every year, millions of new people have to learn chemistry and physics and math and biology and all these things. So, um, yeah, my AdSense revenue has just, it, it just, I mean, I'm seven years in, I'm finally starting to see the signs of plateauing. Uh, the AdSense revenue grew only, I think like 25% in 2022 from 2021. Whereas previously it was growing by like 300% every, you know, I mean, just like insane growth every year. Wow. So it's starting to really uh, plateau a little bit, but still the amount of passive income is very enviable. I mean, I, you know, it was a big time investment. I have over 1200 tutorials. I've been working on this for seven years. So it, it was definitely a huge time investment, but it was very, very worth it because now, I mean, I could essentially retire on, on, on the AdSense revenue, uh, uh, you know, barring any barring any major changes over at YouTube, which I don't think is going to happen. Google's pretty pretty stable, but um, yeah, that that was that was the plan. I mean, th th that really you know around 2016 was when I started to really take the channel seriously. 
And I kind of made that projection based on going on socialblade.com and looking at the few really successful educational channels that existed at the time, like Crash Course and Khan Academy, things like that. And, you know, I, I had that moment where I, I really looked at what they were earning and I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, my jaw dropped when I saw what they were earning. Uh, the YouTube, what, there wasn't as much uh, traffic on YouTube, but there's also way less competition. It wasn't so saturated. So these handful of educational uh, channels were really getting an incredible uh, viewership. And so I thought, you know, well, why can't I do that? I think I could do that. Let's, let's try it out. Let's see if I invest five years of my life into this. What's going to happen? How how far can I get? And uh, it, I was exactly right. It took about five years before the you know it took about four years before I could sort of I was like getting rent and bills, and then another year after that it was quite a bit more, and now it's quite a bit more than that. So uh, it, it's been an, an unbelievable amount of work. I'm totally burnt out. My brain has changed. Into, I, a com, I'm a complete workaholic now. I basically have no ability to relax. Even on vacation, I bother my wife so much because I'm constantly, like, checking things and doing things. I just can't, like, stop ever <laughs> now. Yeah. But um, I'll, I'll trade that because my, my life has fundamentally completely changed. And I have all of this additional freedom and uh, possibilities in front of me because I chose to do that. So, yeah. Well, big congratulations on doing that. As you said, that was a very, very wise decision. And so being so burnt out, but having so yeah. much more potential content still to make, how much more do you expect you will put out? I mean, I, I you know, uh, the goal is to cover every single academic subject, uh, science or otherwise. Uh, I've begun branching out into non-science. So, I mean, I, th there's there's so much. There's so much left to do. I mean, I have about a dozen topics in the work current, in the works currently. Um, let alone what I could hit in the next couple of decades. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, the, the, my current production, you know, model is pretty good because it's uh, it's like a level of sophistication with the production where people find it pretty palatable to watch. You know, it's it's better, it's easier to watch than kind of the blackboard style uh, written tablet learning. But it's obviously not Crash Course. It's not like crazy animated. But it's it's nice looking. But it's so simple that I can basically do everything by myself um, with a lot of effort. But you know, I can kind of crank out the content uh, quite rapidly compared to you know, like a Cures Cassat. Like that's <laughs> that's unbelievable yeah, sure. amount of work. Totally different. And they get the views they deserve for it. You know, I'll never get those those kind of views. But also. You know, I make a video in one one hundredth the time and effort uh, of theirs, so it, it balances out. Sure. So a few follow up questions to that. The first is, how much of this do you already know? Like where you can sit down and essentially just create the video from knowledge in your head, or how much of it do you pull out the textbook and essentially put the chapter in your own words? Almost none of it anymore because, I mean, unless it's chemistry, chemistry, well, even, I mean, I'm doing inorganic, uh, organometallic chemistry content right now. And so I am writing those, but I'm referring to uh, notes from grad school. I had a great inorganic chemistry course uh, in grad school. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working out of those notes. It's not fresh off the top of my head. I took that course, uh, <laughs> you know, a decade ago. So. Um, uh, and so, uh, I mean, at the beginning, like really the only stuff that was truly off the top of my head was my OCHEM lectures, my organic chemistry lectures. I literally performed from memory as though I was teaching the course. So that was right off the top of my head. Everything else I was, uh, well, actually, sadly, my general chemistry content also was written off the top of my head in the tour van, which I now regret because, uh, there's, there's, there are errors in there that are embarrassing and I, I'm very ashamed, but at the time my channel was nothing. I mean, I just, I had no idea how many that these videos would get millions of views. I had no idea. So I was like, yeah, that's about right. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. But, um, after that, I started to, you know, take it a lot more seriously and really, uh, you know, reference everything. So, I mean, the ones that I wrote myself were like biochemistry, biology, math, physics. This is stuff that I did study in, in undergrad. Um, and, and, and found that, you know, I think I'm pretty good at explaining this. Then I pushed it a little further. I even did like anatomy and physiology and biopsychology, again, referring to textbooks. Definitely. I'm not like 
trying to do anything crazy. This is 101 style stuff. Um, but uh, I did that myself. And then eventually I got to the point where I thought I, I'm sort of – I'm bringing in enough revenue that I can hire writers. I can hire grad school – grad students to uh, – to write the script, so you know, zoology, botany, immunology, uh, psychology, uh, all these other topics. You know, why take the time to try to teach myself this stuff when I can just hire somebody who's already an expert, pay them a rate per page, and get the scripts? Uh, and you know, hire a consultant, check everything, have them look at the animations when I'm done, make sure it's uh, make sure everything is is accurate. Um, but so that's been, uh, more my model now for the past couple of years, just as I've, I've more or less exhausted, uh, the topics that I, that I know about apart from chemistry, I am expanding into more advanced, uh, chemistry topics, but, uh, yeah, so that's how it goes right now for the, for the academic tutorials at least. Yeah. Well, in terms of the content that might not be quite as evergreen, but certainly seems to perform really well is essentially anything you put out combating scientific misinformation. I mean, all of those videos do get hundreds of thousands, mm -hmm. if not millions of views, and it's been impressive, honestly, how yeah. mm, I'm not sure how best to put it. You've been very uh, selective with where you've chosen to address these sorts of topics where it must be tempting to put out video after video on that topic and frankly rake in the cash from from doing so. Yeah, I don't want to, Yeah, obviously you're referring to Flat Earth. I, I've done more Flat Earth debunks than I wanted to. Um, mainly, I mean... Usually it's I get you know dragged. In. I mean that's how I got dragged into it. The, you know it wasn't a choice of mine. I was a response to these idiots. But um, yeah, people like them, so I made a few of them. But I definitely you know I want. There's a certain kind of. There's a way I want my channel to be, and just debunking the dumbest pseudoscience imaginable every day is not. That's not really what I want to be. Um, but I like the debunking, and I want to do as, as much of it as possible. I want it to be balanced with my uh, tutorial content. But, um, you know, I, I'm basically done with Flat Earth. I, I'm now going for bigger, l larger threats uh, than, than that one. <laughs> so. One of my favorite videos, and I think one of the, one of the first ones I came across, uh, may have been the one addressing alkaline water and just alkalized products and that type of thing, just because that's something mm -hmm. I have family members who have bought into and I hear all the time, it seems like there's more water on the shelf that's been alkalized and, and similar sort of products. And that seems like where your time might be best spent because there's an endless list of them and they are complete bullshit, complete and utter bullshit, but widely believed so much more than something yeah. like Flat Earth. Yeah, I, I yeah, way, yeah, way more prevalent, obviously. Um, yeah, I've tended to focus on specific characters, specific f people and their fraudulence, but I do have some that go after these concepts like quantum mysticism and these kinds of things. And even in those, I do try to like highlight a few figures that I think are the main culprits. But yeah, it, it, it's it, sometimes I go after a way of thinking that I think is prevalent in, in society and that is erroneous. And uh, natural good, synthetic bad, you know, that kind of stuff is, um, yeah, has always bothered me. So that's the aspect of science communication that I think is, uh, I mean, definitely needed. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody's going to go watch a playlist of chemistry tutorials, but they might watch a, a 30 minute video on, you know, look at how silly this thing is that people will believe. And then, oh no, maybe I, you know, have thought that way in the past and now I can correct my, my errors. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, hopefully I can do quite a lot more of that as well. And I won't drag you back through the whole Flat Earther thing. I know you've been on many other podcasts and discussed it probably ad nauseum. But <laughs> one thing I did want to, to comment on yeah. is I saw on the video, at least your upload of the video from about eight months ago with David Weiss, you seem to receive a lot of criticism for sort of the tone mm -hmm. you, you had throughout that conversation. And you addressed it in your pinned yeah. comment and said, look, this guy is a charlatan. This is, the, this is exactly what he deserves. He's not... You know, he's not deserving of some very more palatable conversation. So I just wanted to relate that more generally. Do you think that our, the aversion for confrontation and I don't want to be one of those people that lingers on wokeness and PC culture and, and whatever, but you see what I'm getting at. Do you think the aversion for conflict yeah. has sort of allowed a lot of the scientific misinformation to persist? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I get a lot of comments that are like, oh, you know, you have different opinions and, you know, he has his own opinion. No, no, he does not have an opinion. He's a liar and a con man. Like, no. Yeah. The, 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 
I, I feel that pseudoscience and misinformation has allow has been allowed to permeate our culture to the degree that it has because we don't stomp it out because we don't aggressively call out liars and charlatans and you know I'll do I'll do debunks on people you know whether they're creationists or whether they're you know these like fraud doctors who are who are peddling this this crap that gets people killed you know because they avoid real medicine and everything these people are monsters and and you're 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 going to get mad at me cuz I you know I'm a mean man and I call them nasty words like are you out of your mind like where you where's the prioritization uh, where where's the sense of urgency here about bigger issues you know and and uh, I I I'm a little salty and maybe a little rough with the language but this is I, I speak to people how they deserve to be spoken to, and I describe people how they truly are. And if, you know, I don't I don't really care if it if it ruffles someone's feathers. This is urgent. If I'm using this language, if I'm using this tone, this is urgent. These people are lying. These people are are toxic influences on our on on society, and they need to be neutralized. And and I'm not, I'm going to call them like I see them. It's a disservice when it's a disservice when you engage with someone who is a fraud or a liar. Or, you know, or paddling something blatantly pseudoscientific, and we treat it as a difference of opinion. When we're talking about evolution versus intelligent design or something like that, you do not, you do not talk about it as though it's two competing theories. It's science and pseudoscience, and, and, you, and you talk about it that way. You, you cannot give this, this false air of validity to these ideas. That is a disservice. That is a disservice. That's much worse than calling these people frauds and charlatans because they objectively are, and we need to use the correct language. Call a, call a spade a spade, you know? So that's how I operate. No, I mean, needless to say, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think uh, I think people have lost sight of what an opinion is versus what a fact is, quite honestly, especially in anything scientific, where, mm -hmm. as you said, people will say, oh, well, this is just the other stream of thought. It's really not. I mean, it's some outlier, baseless, and I agree. I, I, I really think there's, I mean, frankly, I'm one of those people who I'm, I'm a relatively passive person, and I, I typically can't find the right words when I'm in the moment speaking with people. So I think that's why you are the perfect person mm -hmm. to engage with these people, is you have a mastery of of so many different topics and you're willing to sort of get in there and, and put your foot down. Call them out. Yeah. I'll be the hard head. Yeah. I'll be the attack dog. You know, I'll be the ambassador for the scientific community that they, <laughs> that they, that they need, not the one they asked for. <laughs> for sure. Well, we're all cheering you on. And I wanted to, I do want to address one more specific character in, in, in this sort of arc, which is, uh, Dr. James Tor of Rice University. And I find this one to be mm. one of the most frustrating but strangest cases because flat earth is, I mean, yeah. take somebody like David Weiss, like he's, he's in no position to be weighing in in the first place. He doesn't really have, not that he doesn't have the degrees, but he has none of the things you would want to, ha to have in a person who's going to weigh in on these types of issues. The idea is completely He's you one know, of the dumbest of people field. alive. We can just say that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, it's exactly. And in the case of James Tor, I mean, he is a serious scientist. He is a serious synthetic research chemist, and he is he's perfectly equipped to weigh in, if not contribute on something like abiogenesis research. So it, it, frankly, I consider it a little bit terrifying because here's a person who there's just no basis for the stance that they hold. So if for anyone who, who lis who's listening and might not be familiar, if you could just mm -hmm. sort of walk through that whole conflict. Uh, yeah, so he... Um... You know, I get sent a lot of uh, – because I did like the Kent Hovind debate and so I get a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, creationism, intelligent design, et cetera, et cetera. Here's this guy saying this. Here's this guy saying this, um, linking to various apologists. And uh, so I got linked a bunch of times, dozens of times to a couple of videos, one in particular from James Tor, where he's, you know, I'm a synthetic chemist and I know about this and this is ridiculous and all of this research is crap and, you know, they're all lying and this whole, they're corrupt and look at this guy, Jack Shostak, and he's lying to you. It's ridiculous. And I was like, wow, this is, this is intense. Who is this guy? And, uh, you know, so I, I looked a little bit and it was like, this is, wow. I mean, he's being propped up by the Discovery Institute. That, that's the funny thing. I'm doing this series debunking all the, uh, the Discovery Institute people. And, um, 
None of them are actual researchers. Some of them never were. Some used to be scientists and now are apologists. They just write books and stuff. They don't actively do science. But they latched on to this guy, James Tour, because he's the only one. He's the only one in the entire ranks who is an actively publishing scientist. He is a real scientist, right? So the, he's just pra- – he's – you know, put on this enormous pedestal. Look, he's like the smartest guy in the history of time. And, um, you know, I looked at a couple of videos and I was like, all right, this is, this is rubbish. Um, and, uh, he's like really intense and really angry and <laughs> like, all right, no one is debunking this guy. Nobody is like really actively, no one from in the scientific community, which is, I think a shame. I think some people should be stepping up. I, I think a couple tried to, and, uh, he just sort of like, it was, you know, Nick Matsky tried to, you know, go over to his office and explain evolution to him. And he was like, no, thanks. I, I, I decline. And, um, mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, I'll make a video. And I tried to be pretty uh, soft with the tone. I wasn't re- – I genuinely wasn't really trying to ruffle too many feathers. I just wanted to take some of these talking points and explain how they're wrong. And it wasn't even just him. I was talking about uh, uh, creationist talking points against abiogenesis, mainly the ones he says, but then also dumber ones that he would never say because – they're very dumb, although I had to retract that later because he then used some of them. So it's like, oh, my God, I can't believe he yeah, said this of course, stuff. Of course. But uh, so I made a little video. It was like 40 minutes, you know. Yeah. And uh, and he flipped out. And, uh, at the, you know, with the aid of uh, Discovery Institute and all their editors and all the funding and everything, made this 13-part series about how dumb I am. And uh, it was insane. Just like quote mining researchers, misrepresenting research. Lying about basic chemistry, just like a, a, a parade, just a, a complete Dunning Kruger farce. It was unbelievable. Um, and then, uh, so I obviously had to respond. So I made a two part series, just going through that series and exposing all of it uh, as, as, as ridiculous to, to show how ridiculous it was. Because the problem is, because he understands chemistry, he can use chemistry speak to sort of dazzle the viewer and go, Look how smart I am. Look at all this crazy synthesis stuff. You think, you know, that happened by itself? And uh, his followers just go, Oh, wow, he's really smart. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And uh, just blindly believe everything. They understand nothing. They understand a word he's saying. And they come over to my channel, He's the best guy ever. I'm like, You have no clue what he's talking about talking about um so i made that series and uh uh i think he really 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 underestimated me um because the response was really devastating and i think it really hurt his feelings and was a pretty big blow to the ego he didn't do much for a while it's, it's been like a year and a half i think i don't know how long it's been but they got a lot of views so a lot of people saw exactly how dishonest and and quite frankly ignorant he is it's it's not just that he's a liar he really genuinely does not understand many aspects of of the field of origin of life research because it's not synthetic chemistry there's geochemistry and astrochemistry and systems chemistry he doesn't even know what systems chemistry is i mean he tries to use the word autocatalysis and uses it incorrectly and stuff and uh, he just he really doesn't know about it and he's and he's he's avoiding it He's specifically avoiding learning about it. He's smart enough to learn about it. If I can learn about it, he can learn about it. But when I read the papers, I'm trying to understand it. He's trying to find ways to discredit it, which he can't because it's science. So he has to go into cognitive dissonance mode and, you know, try to shelter himself from from this science he doesn't like. And um, so it's been a while. And no, he, he's finally back at it and he's putting out more. Uh, videos, uh, uh, ironically, not so much about me, but about scientists that I had featured in that uh, in that series, just uh, as as though he doesn't have to respond to the 50 plus papers that I uh, showed that prove him wrong. But uh, so, yeah, he's doing more content and uh, which is great. I get to do more content showing how even dumber he I mean, like the the first series was pretty ridiculous. This stuff is uh, I mean, it's kind of jaw droppingly ridiculous. Like he t- continues to try to take some kind of high road but he's like showing clips of me like from music videos and stuff and i'm just like what what are you doing (laughs) what are you doing james it's 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 astounding to see um with uh, with all this content like he's just like he used to be just this scientist that had these weird views and now he's like i mean he's a joke he's he's a joke on uh, at rice he's a joke to scientists and uh i'm having a lot of fun uh, pushing his buttons and <laughs> pushing him closer and closer, I think, to a mental breakdown. But uh, so, yeah, I'm excited to, for him to finally finish this other series. I'll put out a nice 
I don't know how long, a couple, couple videos. Uh, I think it'll be a little shorter just because he's kind of not saying anything new almost at all. So I'll just be like, hey, I debunked that already. Remember? I debunked that already. Remember? Um, but uh, so look out for that in a month or two. I don't know how long. It'll, whenever he's done. And, and I actually reached out to him along when I reached out to you, not to coordinate any conversation or something, but just to get the chance myself to, to push him on some of these things. I mean, again, I'm far from the most equipped person mm -hmm. to do it, but I do have my own background in chem. I could at least try to get basic answers to, because as you say in your own videos responding to him, he simply doesn't address much of the criticisms. And then he has the same talking points. And, you know, one that comes to mind is how nobody's, there's no explanation for glucose. How could we, how could, how could glucose be synthesized? And you point out, you know, well, maybe enzymes evolved first. And there's just very fundamental things like that, that just, you know, right over the head. And yeah. I'm, I'm torn is whether, cause he, he, he must know, he must hear these things. Do you think he's just dishonest? Is he, is it just a financial gain thing or is he just, it's just, cognitive dissonance he's a creationist for for as long as as he's been alive and he's not uh, willing to come to terms with it i think all three it's hard to say i'm not a psychologist he obviously knows he's being dishonest when he takes like uh text from a paper and cuts part out of it and takes it out you know like the stuff with matt pounder like he's pretending that a origin of life researcher is debunking origin of life research it's like who, how dumb do you have to be to think that this is saying this? So obviously the, the, the tactics are very, are so unbelievably manipulative that it's impossible to think he is not at least somewhat cognizant of, uh, cognizant of what he's doing. But with these kinds of fundamentalists, like, I mean, liars for Jesus is the perfect way to put it. And I think that there's some mentality of like, if I can lie, if it's for Jesus, if it's for the good of the faith and everything. And so, you know, be he and Myers, you know, all, all these guys, um, you know, less, you know, the, the other guys I'm debunking over for the, for the, for the DI stuff. I mean, it, it, the, it's such blatantly manipulative tactics. They must know they are doing it, but, um, you know, they think it's justified and also money, right? I mean, James is now, I mean, I think that there has to have been some impact on his funding. All this activity has to have some kind of repercussion. I mean, he's a, he's a joke now. And so, uh, I don't know. I mean, the DI obviously pays him, you know, I don't know how much, I don't know how often, but, uh, it's more than zero. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's definitely being propped up. He's the only guy they have. He's the only real scientist they have. And so it, the stakes are high. I mean, he's getting humiliated by a YouTuber that does not, they're not, they're not happy with this. They're not happy with what's going on with what I'm doing. So they're really pulling out all the stops, all the character assassination. You know, look at Dave in the music video, slap the guy, and he's evil. He's an evil Satan man. It's like, dude, how can anyone fall for this? It's just, it blows my mind. But uh, luckily, the viewership he's getting right now is not that high. So I, I think not that many people are dumb enough to to uh to fall for this stuff but definitely in in the in the thousands or tens of thousands so and they're very vocal and they come they still come over to my channel and go james is right and you're wrong go, really how be specific well because he's a scientist and you're not yeah but how am i wrong oh well he's just he's smarter than you yeah but be specific how am i wrong well you're mean you're a mean butt it's like oh my god you people are worse than flat earthers they're the dumbest people i can't even believe it <laughs> No, because it's exactly like you said. They don't actually know anything. They're just for some, whatever reason they've just latched on to him. He just he comes across as the the big science man, and he does have the the accolades to boot. So I think that's enough for people. And I don't think he's converting anyone. I think it's just people yeah. who have always been this way, and he's just another character for them to sort of, like you yeah. said, yay for Jesus, whatever works. Yeah, they're just desperately holding on to who they have already. I mean, the, the rest of the DI, too, when they, you know, uh, Gunter Beckley is putting out hit pieces on me based on my debunks of Luskin and Meyer, and it's just the same tactics. Look how mean this evil atheist Satan man is. Don't go look at his videos. Don't go Don't go see what he says. There's no point. He's an evil, evil man. Uh, they just, they're desperately holding, cl clutching on to the, the last little bit of influence that they have. And I'm sort of prying their fingers off one by one. And <laughs> sure. it's, uh, it's, it's really fun for me. I have to admit it's un incredibly satisfying to just be butchering them like this. Yeah.
Well, it's satisfying for viewers as well. It's sort of reminiscent of, you know, 2014, 2016 YouTube, where this type of thing was completely ubiquitous across the platform. So I welcome its return very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, you mentioned you were more focused on addressing, like, n there's no threat of flat, flat earthers, you know, making that the, the dominant opinion. It's never going to happen. Same thing with a lot of the, at least the more extreme mm -hmm. side of creationism. But what do you see as some of the things that are most threatening today? I assume perhaps anti-vaxxing, um, that type of thing. But if you have any others. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. The more I do this, the more I see it as all one thing. Because those of us who are educated in the sciences, we have a very firm understanding of the compartmentalization of natural phenomena. So you have physics, and that studies this. And you have chemistry, and that studies this. And geology studies this. And astronomy studies this. To those who are not just ignorant of science, but, but anti-science, it's just science. And so... Unfortunately, we don't really have the luxury of ignoring any particular science now. Like very recently, what I did was um, there was this guy lying about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, uh, proving the Big Bang is wrong, right? Big news. Everybody's – you know, I have so many people – did you hear the James Webb Space Telescope proves that the Big Bang didn't happen? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. At all, not even a little bit. And so I had to go and, you know, debunk that a little bit and, you know, definitely link to astrophysicists who have more to say about it. But um, the thing is, for somebody who is, is ignorant of all science and anti-science, they go, oh, those lying scientists about the Big Bang and they're lying about the vaccine and they're lying about the climate. It's all one thing. They think that science is like 20 dudes in white coats in one room doing all the science together. And so there's no compartmentalization for them. So unfortunately, yes, I, I know that lies about climate and lies about medical stuff are much more urgent than lies about cosmology or lies about, you know, Bible stuff or whatever, that kind of a thing. But it's not, it's not received that way to the general public, to them, any, any area in which they can be receiving a message that science is lies and uh, corruption will ripple into any other area of science. And so, yes, we're definitely right now seeing a very extreme spike in vaccine hesitancy or, or anti-vax mentality, which is completely unfounded and completely based on lies on the internet. Just look at all these deaths. What deaths? What are you talking about? Someone told you that and you believe them. That's what's going on right now. And um, that is much more urgent. But I, I really believe that somebody can go, oh, scientists are lying about space. So they're lying about this and think it's all one thing. So it's really all must be addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree. And I've, I've heard you in previous podcasts talk about it or sort of frame it as an anti-establishment issue more than anything. And I would completely agree yep. because I have close friends who have their degrees mm -hmm. in, in mathematics and physical sciences and so on, people who are totally equipped to see through all of this, and yet they still don't. And it's just the only explanation and that they are yep. you know, sort of openly anti-establishment in other ways. And I think that is the root problem. So how about how do you have any feelings about how to address that? I think what I like to do is, I mean, if, if, you can, if you can show someone how something is wrong, how something is a lie, and then sort of uh, articulate the framework with which someone can have constructed that or have come to fall for that, they can sort of see their own bias. They can, they can, it's like putting a mirror up to someone's bias. And hopefully if they're a mature person, they can kind of they can see that and they can they can adjust a little bit um uh you know because a, a lot of these people like to to profess themselves as as skeptics or rational or you know they, they like to uh yeah you, you know look at do all the research and look at everything um but unfortunately they're 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 not skeptical they're not skeptical of the sources that they're biased towards right somebody told me something on the internet that checks out right that that's good enough for them as opposed to, you know, what science has, knows to be true. I mean, we're talking about things as utterly trivial and basic as the existence of pathogens. We're seeing a resurgence in terrain theory or the denial of, of bacteria and viruses that they even exist at all. There's so many people who think that viruses don't exist. It's insane. It's insane. And, you know, 
I just, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know exactly how to approach someone that is in that, that has that level of denial of reality, but you, but you can, you know, you can try. I mean, you, one thing I'll do is I'll, I'll bring up these guys, Andrew Kaufman, Andrew Wakefield, these, these guys, and I'll show the con, right? I'll pull the curtain ba- uh, up and show the con. Here are the lies. Here's how they're making, here's exactly how they are making money from this. Right. And so, hey, you hate people making money off of lies. Here's a guy making money off of lies. It's not a big pharmaceutical industry, a pharmaceutical company. It's one guy, but he's lying to make money. All right. Pharma, we can talk about pharma too. Good things, bad things, whatever you want, you know, but let's, let's talk about it for real. Let's, let's really talk about it. Not pharma's hiding the cure for cancer. It's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Um, so my angle is to just debunk to smithereens the, the conspiracy theories and expose the frauds for who they are. You, you're never going to get them all. You're never going to get 100. percent You're never going to convert. You can. You're never going to convert 50. percent If I can convert 10, percent there will be a trickle effect. They'll speak in their personal circles and, you know, explain this stuff to people. But um, yeah, you just try and you do your best and uh, just put it all out there. I put it all out there as very matter of factly and succinctly as possible, and hope for the best. <laughs> That's it. So. Yeah, I I would completely agree. And it does seem like there's been a resurgence in people trying to actively address this and make videos, make podcasts, whatever it is, have the conversations with family members. So I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic that we are slowly but surely going to trend back the other way. Fingers crossed. Too early to say for now. But another another big piece of the puzzle that's missing that I'm sure you'll agree with is just scientific literacy, period. I mean, I think the educational system has lost sight of the point of having students take chemistry, biology, physics, et cetera. I mean, I guess, broadly speaking, there's two purposes. One is to encourage students to pursue it at a higher level in the future and enter the workforce as chemists and physicists and engineers. But probably more importantly is to have every student leaving high school with a basic understanding of physical reality so that they understand when they, they go to mm-hmm. reach and grab the door, you know, just the basic could, drawing a force diagram of how that's happening and the atoms and molecules that compose it and so on. So do you see any, any significant need for educational reform? Yeah. How would you like to see things changed? So it's very hard question to answer. It's a great question. It's hard to answer because I, I did receive that education. I did receive that education in high school. I went, I, I went to a public school. It was a very good public school in Fairfield County, Connecticut. So it's an affluent area. Um, but I got that public education and I, I, st- I took bio two years of chem and physics. Uh, and then I went to, to college ready. You know, I, I, I tested out of intro chem and, and was a chem major. And it was all just a seamless uh, thing. You know, I felt that I, that I got that education. And I subsequently, you know, I did finish a master's in, in science education. And so I'm, I'm uh, fairly familiar with science curricula and how they are implemented into the public school system. And I think that they are good curricula. Obviously, you have low-income areas and you have places where the teachers aren't good and, and, and they don't have the resources. And so some students just get the short end of the stick and they don't get that education. And I think that that's, that's an issue of budget. I think that uh, obviously I would love to get to restructure the federal budget, and, you know, take some money out of defense and put it into education. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I don't know that we need large scale educational reform in, in the sense of curricula restructuring because they're there. They're, they're, they're good. And when they're implemented properly, students learn. I mean, not everybody wants to be a scientist and that's fine. Um, but, um, so I don't know, I don't know how to, how to fix this, the, the schools that aren't doing it right. Uh, that's, uh, hopefully someone can figure that out. We can, uh, you know, appoint someone, uh, to, to cabinet positions that, that aren't imbeciles and, and actually can, can do something in their position. Um, but, um, yeah, I, uh, maybe the other aspect is cultural, and so we are seeing a little bit of a popularization of science, right? Nerdiness being cool and things like that. Um, it's a little bit memeified, which bothers me, um, and so it's not it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. It's certainly better than when I was a kid. When I was a young kid, uh, it was not cool to be nerdy and not cool to know things. Now it's better. It is cool to know things, certainly to an extent, or at least, you know, I've lived in a few places in the country and, um, that, you know, that's my sense of it, that, 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 uh, it, that nerdiness is, is cooler than it, that it once was even in my lifetime. So, 
I think we're on the right track. Uh, like you, I'm cautiously optimistic. And, and in fact, a big part of what I do, or, or at least w- uh, what I want to be a big part of what I do moving forward is I, uh, I do give talks at universities um, sort of uh, trying to, to get undergrads and grad students to warm up to the idea of SciComm as a career. So I give a talk. I talk about my path to science communication because it is still a very fresh field. It's a new field. Um, but for for very important reason, right? This is this is emerging because of the incredible problems that we're now having. We're seeing um, what what we'll, we're seeing the full impact of the internet on epistemology, on what a society thinks to, to be true or thinks they know to be true, and um, we in fact need an entire army of science literate professionals who are not busy doing science. Scientists are far too busy doing science to be, uh, to, to, to focus heavily on SCICOM. A handful have done it, Carl Sagan, obviously, and, and figures like that. Um, but uh, it would be much better if we had thousands of people who just, that was their job to sit around all day and figure out how to explain science to people and how to curb misinformation and make content to do so. So I go to universities and I, and I talk about my path to SCICOM and I, and I urge other students, if, if you are like me and you never found any kind of passion for, for work in the lab and never enjoyed it, um, and I, I, only, I only wanted to be an artist anyway. I only was doing it just to get the degree. But um, I think that there are a lot of people that find themselves in the lab as a grad student and go, you know what? I kind of don't really like doing this. Great. Come to SciComm, right? Come over to, to this side. It's a lot of fun. You get to be, you get to tell stories and you get to do all kinds of fun things and make videos or you make, or you make TikToks or you, you know, or you're, you're a journalist or you, there's so many ways to do it. There's so many ways to do it and we need you. We really, really need you. We need, we need a lot of, a lot of people to, 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 to join up and, and, uh, and push back here because this is a war. Whether you want to, whether you want to be part of it or not, or whether you acknowledge it or not, there's a war happening. And I see it to be as the biggest problem facing humanity right now is us not being able to figure out how to get everybody to know what's true. And, uh, so that's, uh, that's why, uh, although art is still kind of like the main goal for me, a big chunk of my passion has, has redirected towards this just because I see how, how dire the circumstances are. And I feel a sense of duty because I feel I, I'm uniquely equipped to, to do it. I feel I'm very effective at it and therefore must do it. So here, here we go. <laughs> no, I, I, I could not possibly agree more. And it's funny the way you laid all of that out, because that's almost exactly my experience. I finished my master's degree at the beginning of last year now, and uh, I had the same feeling. I, I, I enjoyed it for what it was, but by the time it was over, I realized this, I'm not making the big breakthrough discovery. As great as this is and as good as it is to get my hands dirty and, and get to the, those higher levels of knowing and knowledge, I realized that the big impact I could make was in science communication in one way or another. And this is, this is one example of me trying to do that. And I hope to do many of the many of the things you're alluding to. And, and I work aside from doing this, I'm working as a freelance writer and consultant and specifically in SciComm at every opportunity I can get. So for anyone listening mm-hmm. who's in a similar boat, I am very I mean, this is early in my sort of journey through doing all of this. But I can say with 100 percent confidence, I'm already very happy to be doing what I am. And as you said, we need a few thousand more people doing it far better than certainly I will ever be at doing this. Yeah. And uh, I think it's it's very literally enough to change the world pretty substantially. So could not agree more. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. it can exactly. be done. A career exactly. in SciComm is is achievable. Mm-hmm. So okay, so we're we're also coming up on an hour, so I don't want to get too deep in any other topics. So I'll ask you one final question, if that's all right with you, which is uh, for somebody mm-hmm. exactly. Yep. the type of person we were just alluding to, what would be your one biggest piece of advice? Not necessarily leave your degree and, and go to SciComm, but you know, for anybody interested in science, what is your piece of advice? Oh, not to do? I mean, my, well, my advice would be go do SciComm. <laughs> but um, I okay. think, you know, tr- try to, try to um, think really hard about what it is that you want to do. And uh, think about what you enjoy doing, right? If you are that person that wakes up every morning and thinks, I can't wait to get to the lab because I'm going to finish that experiment and it's going to be awesome. And then I'm going to figure out the next thing I'm going to do and I can't wait. This is my favorite thing ever. 
awesome. You're a scientist and you're going to go to be a scientist. Or maybe you go into academia and, 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 you, and you have a passion for teaching. And I really enjoy teaching, but ultimately it was not exactly what I wanted to do. But, um, you know, when, if you think you're cut out for SciComm, what you're saying is that you're cut out for entrepreneurship. And that's, that's a hurdle. That's a challenge. I find it to be very invigorating because I have, I'm a workaholic. Um, but you kind of need to be you, – you need to be ready to invest a lot of time and a lot of effort. And you can't be discouraged by small hurdles like learning a new type of software or, or, or figuring out how to do – you know, open your business bank account and like these kinds of things. You have to be ready to do a lot of stuff by yourself. Um, for next to no money at first, but if you can do it, you've got your own business and then there's no cap, uh, there's no cap on your income. I mean, it's like, it's uh, even, even a, you know, a, a really, uh, you know, a successful scientist, how, there's somewhat of a limit to how much you're going to make, you know, and as, especially, you know, an entry level scientist, that's a good first job. But you know, I've invested a certain uh, por you know portion of my my time at this phase in my life, and I mean, th we're talking about only six seven years for the dividends to to really to really pay off. So, um, just get ready to work really hard, and be real as long as you're really passionate <laughs> about what you're doing, it's it's probably going to work out to at least some degree, uh, and then you don't have to have a whole life of being in a job that you don't want to do, which is uh, pretty great. It's kind of the greatest thing to uh, work for yourself and enjoy what you do.